Tech Sideline is presented by First Bank and Trust Company, the bank that puts you first. They can meet your banking and financing needs for personal, agricultural, business, commercial, mortgages, and so much more. Visit firstbank.com to learn more. What's going on, Hokie Nation? Happy Victory Monday as Virginia Tech picks up their first ACC win with a business trip out west taking care of business against Stanford. We got the whole football crew on set. We're unpacking it all. It's episode 381 of the Tech Sideline Podcast, and it starts right now. And again, we come at you on a Monday, October 7th, 2024, from our high-tech studio at the Virginia Tech Corporate Research Center. Remember to like, subscribe, refer the show to a friend, and head over to techsideline.com to check out our extensive editorial content. Subscriptions are just $12 a month for loads of content, and for Virginia Tech students, your subscription is free. Tech Sideline is presented by First Bank and Trust Company. The Tech Sideline podcast is also brought to you by The Hokie Way. The Hokie Way thanks Virginia Tech fans for their support of our mission to leverage student-athletes' name, image, and likeness in support of charitable organizations. To learn more about us and the organizations that we support, visit us at thehokieway.org. I'm your host, Giovanni Heater. To my right is Chris Coleman, our lead analyst and columnist. Across the way, senior staff writer Andy Bitter. And in the fourth chair, managing editor David Cunningham. Nick Brown, the mustache man, pushing the buttons behind the scenes. And we'll start, guys, by asking, how was the trip out west to the Bay Area for, uh, for you two? It was great. We did everything out there, like all the touristy things in San Francisco, Golden Gate Bridge, Lombard Street. Finally got to Alcatraz on Sunday. We were in the Pacific Ocean at the beach. We we did everything that you possibly could out there. So I made the most of a, a West Coast trip. It's it's weird that Stanford is in the ACC, but, you know, enjoy it. Enjoy it right now. We'll see how long it lasts and take advantage of these opportunities. Yeah, it was great. I'd never been out there. Andy had... Uh, I believe you went to Alcatraz last when you were like 12. I was like 12, I think, last time I went there. And I'm like, I'm going back. Nice. Got to get back to the rock. Andy was determined to get back, and, and he did. And it was awesome. We went yesterday. Um, but we also you know, went by Oracle Park. That ballpark is beautiful. Uh, went over and uh, wandered around Cal's campus a little bit or drove around Cal's campus a little bit yesterday. Got yelled at to leave at the Oakland Coliseum. <laughs> that too. <laughs> they were very like, don't come in here, get off the premises. It's like, there's nobody there. Nobody plays there anymore. <laughs> like, what do you? What is the security for? So uh, less welcoming in Oakland, I guess, than uh, previously on our trip. But it was a fun trip overall. Yeah. I heard that, that you guys taught our phenomenal photographer, Ivan, uh, what a margarita is. Yes. Did I see that in the yeah, group chat this we weekend? Just, now he we just drinks them all the time. <laughs> like, these are, these are great. It's like, yeah, they're pretty good. I can't believe he's never had Come on no, now. I, so, yeah, we were we were in the Pacific Ocean. Then we went and had margaritas and tacos at this place nearby. So he, he's, in the, he's into the West Coast living, I guess. That sounds magical. And there was a football game as well. We're going to get into it. Chris, where did you spend uh, your Saturday watching the ball game? Oh, I watched it at Champs. All right. Nice. Yeah. Burger? Uh, yes, actually. I had a Sharky's. I had a burger at Sharky's. Okay. I went to Champs. But yeah. the burger but the, the win streak is alive? Not, it's, no, 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 no. It's no. over. <laughs> okay. It ended it against Rutgers. Okay. So, All right. Yeah. So no more. I just had a burger because I liked it this time. Okay. Yeah. There we go. There we go. I got a little bit lost on my way out west. Ended up in Columbus, Ohio and yeah. saw Ohio State... Uh, play Iowa but but the most eventful thing of the entire weekend was the night before rocking a, a Kyle McCord jersey in a slew of Ohio State fans watching Syracuse beat UNLV in overtime that was that was a little chaotic so it sounds like we all had a great weekend the Hokies did as well it, it just went out there and again felt like a business trip didn't do anything that dropped your jaw by any means game maybe could have been closer but the Hokies pulled away early on and, and they walk away with a 31 to 7 victory out there I think we can declare that the curse of the backup quarterback is over in fact I think Virginia Tech defensively is the curse for all backup quarterbacks now in the last seven games the Hokies have played dating back to the military bowl they faced three backup quarterbacks, which is somewhat fortunate. That's a pretty high percentage of your games where you're facing a backup quarterback. But in the but they're three and zero against backup quarterbacks. 
Those players are, are averaging fewer than 100 yards passing per game with no touchdown passes and two interceptions. Virginia Tech is absolutely dominating backup quarterbacks right now. So, like, you, you saw the jokes going into this game when it didn't seem like Ashton Daniels was, was going to start, and I'm like, well, the, I think the last couple times against backups have gone pretty well. And now, yeah, this is the third straight time where it's been absolute domination against a backup quarterback. So I think that uh, streak is over. That's what you're supposed to do against backup quarterback. <laughs> right. Like that's the norm. You're not supposed to like, oh, they threw for 450 yards on you. It's like, well, that's that's sort of unusual. Uh, no, I think it was a it was a nice win out there. Um, I, I think you keep in mind that you know Stanford was picked to finish last in the ACC and it had its backup quarterback. So you know, what were you facing out there? Maybe not quite the same team that you know went and beat Syracuse earlier this year. So uh, that said. Uh, you know, Tech controlled the game pretty much start to finish. I know that Stanford moved the ball a little bit in those first two drives, missed a field goal, then fumbled at the two-yard line where the, the Hokies seemed to have a knack for, for forcing turnovers inside their six-yard line uh, lately in this game. But, you know, touchdown on the first drive. I think they had like eight real drives in the game, scored on five of them. It was a real limited possession game, and they made the most of those opportunities. Uh, Kyron Drones was very efficient. Uh, you know, the first 200-yard passing game since the opener, and he did it on 19 passes. I think that was a nice uh, effort by him. And it had a nice pass to Daquan Felton that was a little bit behind him, but it had to be. It had to be in that tight window, and that went for a touchdown. So uh, just solid all around. Uh, they ran the ball okay against a, a pretty tough rush defense. I, I think you're not going to circle that one and look, look back and go, that's where it started. They, they turned the corner with that one with some, you know, 600-yard effort or something like that. But they went out there and they handled themselves and, and you know, fly back five and a half hours on a, a winning airplane. How about uh, the fact that it feels like when this team wins, to Chris's point in, in his most recent article on Sunday, they win big. Looking at the margin of victory, uh, under Brent Pry, this team is winning by 20.4 points per game. And you have one outlier in there in 2022 when they beat Liberty by just one point. Everything else uh, is... 17 or more, and most of them are in the 20s and uh, even up into the 30s against UVA last year. So it's bizarre. They're not winning the close ones. We know that one in one in 10 under Brent Pry, but uh, when they win, they, they kick your butt. Yeah, and I thought they got off to a good start, and then you know they just kept their their foot on the gas. Uh, I thought that that first drive was important. Obviously, you want to get off to a a seven nothing start. I mean, that's always ideal, but. Those two Stanford drives that they put together to start the game, they took a lot of time off the clock and. It was really hot, so that drive was really important because it got got the Tech defense a break in there. If you'd gone out there and gone three and out uh, right after that first uh, drive, then you know you're getting pretty worn down defensively. I think so. That was a very important drive. Um, I, I thought strategically, Virginia Tech really handled this game well. I wasn't too happy with the Miami game when they threw the ball more than they ran it. I mean, they were running the ball well against Miami. And they had the lead for most of the game. So why would this team, would you pass it more than you run it? Um, I didn't think that was a very good strategy as a result. This time they ran, they ran it a lot more than they threw it. Uh, they paid attention to their own strengths. Yes, Stanford's strength defensively is stopping the run, their weak, and their weakness is stopping the pass. But, you know, Virginia Tech went with what they're good at. And I think that was very important. And they did just enough in the running game where I thought it opened up the passing game to a certain extent. I thought they how they used Kyron Drones in this game was the best they've used him all year. They started off the game with a bunch of run re, one read plays, um, got his confidence up, and I thought he was a little more assertive and less hesitant later in the game um, because he. I think he gained confidence because he was having success early in the game. So uh, I, 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 th I thought that was a sound approach to the game by Virginia Tech. Uh, you know, good game planning, uh, good overall strategy. Chris, you had mentioned this was called the, the check with me approach. What does yep. that mean for people? Uh, well, when you see Kyron Drones, uh, you know, they go up to the line of scrimmage like they've got the play. They see how the opposing defense uh, – lines up and then drones kind of stands up looks over to the sideline gets a new play call and then they snap it immediately um that's what that's something they did last year to then it had success it's something they hadn't been doing much of this year particularly in that first game against vanderbilt when vanderbilt kind of manipulated the offense into running the plays that vandy wanted them to run um i, I it takes the it takes a lot of the decision making burden off of drones um it limits his responsibilities, and again, that could free him up mentally. Maybe he played a little bit better because of that. But 
the one thing it does is it gets the right play call into the game as opposed to relying on drones to, to read the defense and, and, and make those decisions at the line of scrimmage. It slows the tempo down a little bit to a certain extent, but that's fine. I, I think a lower tempo is good for this team because this is a, a team that's going to be a running team. Um, it doesn't need to be a high-tempo team. It's most important to get it right than to operate at a faster tempo. And uh, and I, I think they, I think you saw part of their success against Stanford was due to you know just flat out getting the plays right, which is something they had been struggling with to a certain extent before. Also, interesting comments from Drones afterwards, where he says, "I'm I'm back to being myself now." And you know, he went on. He's like, "I'm focused on being me." It felt like I was trying to be somebody I wasn't earlier this year. It kind of sounds like. You know, they didn't, didn't feel comfortable in what they were asking him to do and, uh, you know, maybe stepping in there and being a pocket passer and going through, you know, four or five reads or whatever it is. Maybe that's just not his strength. Uh, so I, I think they're they're coming around and figuring out, OK, this is what we should be asking Kyron to do. This is how he's uh, effective in this. And, you know, maybe mentally he put a little bit too much on himself. I mean, it was a full off season of uh, like, you know, we said it here, like this team's ceiling is based on, you know, Kyron drones, development, dark horse highs, right? And like uh, yeah. know, all the other stuff going on with the team that all the returning guys returning production were very excited. But the reason that you felt that the season could be very special was because the quarterback was back and that's a lot of pressure and a lot of stuff to put on your shoulders. So maybe he was feeling that a little bit and tried to be something that he wasn't, but certainly looks like he's getting back to himself. It, it, you know, interestingly, you get into 200 yards pass in this game. Uh did it on 19 passes. That was his fewest passes all year. Uh 14 of 19. One was a drop by Jalen Lane that was a, a perfect pass that would have been a first down pass on that one. Uh so, you know, really you know, four incompletions that are on him. Only one that was like really bad. It was that one right before halftime. We're like, Oh my gosh, what are you doing? Never should have been asked to throw the ball. <laughs> yeah. They should have taken a knee on that. You know, it was 17 seconds at your own 20 yeah. or something like that. Like, but yeah, when he, he let that one go, I was like, Oh my, that's how you let the other team get back in the game. And they have done nothing to that point. That's the only one though, where you really felt like that. So I, I thought it was a strong game by drones and he, you know, the rest of the offense is, is doing what it's been doing. Bashal Tootin continues to just churn out yards. And I think if this offense gets going like that, this team could be pretty good. Yeah, you know, you brought up a good point about the number of pass attempts. Uh, and I ran, I updated these numbers yesterday from our article. And in games that, that Drones has started, that Virginia Tech has lost, he's averaged 29.75 attempts per game. In games that they've won, he's averaged 22 attempts per game. Some of that is dictated a little bit by the time and the score sure. and things like that. But uh, you know, maybe he get t- gets taken out early because they're blowing somebody out. But at the same time, he got taken out early, you know, against Louisville last year when Tech was getting blown out. Um, but I, I think it seems fairly obvious that if you're running the football and you're, it makes you more efficient in the passing game. And the more Tech throws it, probably the less efficient. That they're going to be. They have to target their throws, uh, pick their opportunities, pick their types of throws. And when they do that, they're very efficient at it. But when they, they, they drop back and try to th- just throw it 34 times like they did against Miami, I don't think that leads to a particularly efficient performance. I'd like to replay the Miami game for a lot of reasons, but I think the one thing I'd like to do over was, you know, maybe get those passing attempts between the 20 and 25 range. And, and get your running tem- attempts up a little bit more, pr- particularly with uh, you know, how hot it was uh, down there, how muggy it was. And I do think Tech probably got worn down a little bit in the uh, second half. And, and I think maybe a slightly different strategy there might have led to a better result. Chris, I'd love to ask you this, and then we're going to go to David uh, in just a second. Kind of piggybacking off your point, which is why I bring it up now. You'd also written about how maybe they got to incorporate Malachi Thomas um, a little bit more. It was either you or Andy, so pardon me if it uh, wasn't yeah, that you. Yeah, that was me. And, um, and, and so two and had 19 carries against Miami. Drones, I'd have to look at the exact number he had. You know, Tootin's playing a little bit banged up. Where would you have liked to seen the carries go against the Canes when you got a running back that's, you know, got that, that braced up knee and you can yeah. only tote so much load? I mean, yeah, probably got to use another running back. They got they got P.J. Prelo carry, which, you know, he took the distance. True. got called back for a hold. Um, probably a few more for Malachi Thomas is, is probably how it should break down. He's, he's getting enough play. He's getting more most of his play in right time right now, like third and long situations. So he's only carrying the ball about 23% of his snaps. Whereas Tootin is carrying the ball approximately 40% of his snaps. So uh, it's a pretty good likelihood that when Malachi Thomas is in the game, Virginia Tech is not going to give him the ball. So you've got to figure out that part of it or else maybe defenses are going to figure out um, that uh, you know they can focus on some other things when, when he's in the game. Um, 
the good news is I think you're going to see a really fresh tooting over the next two games because you've got the bye week now. And so that should be 20-plus carries against Boston College. And then you've got two extra days between Boston College and Georgia Tech. So he should be pretty True. fresh for that one, too. So I, you sh- I'm looking for 20-plus carries from Tootin for each of the next two games. Two colossal games uh, coming up on the Virginia Tech schedule. Luckily, both of them are at lane, and one of them's at night. That definitely uh, adds to it a little bit. David, what you got in the fourth chair? Yeah, w- one of the things that stood out to me about how this offense has operated over the last two games specifically is the Hokies aren't getting behind the sticks as much. And I think that kind of changes the entire game plan for them. Um, Brent Pry always talks about, you know, we have to stay on schedule. And we, when we get off schedule, it's really tough. And same thing goes, you know, f- for when Tech is on defense. Um, Kyron Jones was only sacked one time on, on Saturday. And I believe Basial Tootin only had, uh, he only lost six yards. I believe that was only on one play. Maybe it was on two. But the Hokies aren't having negative plays. And I one of the things I do during the game is I chart first down plays. And what run pass, how many yards it gained. Tech had two incomplete passes on first down and one rush of zero of either zero or a loss. Every other play on 23 first down attempts. So you take out those three. 20 of the 23 were positive plays. Mm. They might have only been, you know, there were five or six that were between one and three. Um, Most of them were between four and seven, and then there were a couple that were between uh, eight or more. Um, But the Hokies are are doing a really good job, it feels like, of being balanced. Uh, Chris, you mentioned, I think you tweeted about it, a little smoke and mirrors a little bit more. I thought there was a little bit more, especially on that initial drive. Yeah, it feels like they're doing a good job of being very, very balanced and a little bit more unpredictable, and they're sticking to their strengths a little bit more. They're slowing it down. They're not trying to, you know, go everywhere at once. It's kind of like, okay, they're being, it feels, it just feels like overall they're being more methodical about it. And I think you're seeing it. And it also helps that the pass protection, I think, has been pretty good. Kyron Jones hasn't really, uh, you know, he didn't take any, any shots really. Um, on Saturday against Stanford. So I think all of that together, you know, Kyron Jones looks more comfortable. The offense is playing better. And when you don't get behind the sticks, it certainly helps. I'll tell you what, I love these these end arounds that they're using with Jalen Lane. They used one for a touchdown against Miami, and they actually got Colin Schley in on the action, yeah. lined up as a receiver, initially hand off to him going one way, and then he pitches it to Lane running across him the other way, and they take it to the house. And then uh, they had another one work out. Didn't have the double deception, yeah. didn't have Schley in there, but they ran the end around, and, and that's working nicely with Jalen Lane. Eventually, they're going to let Schley do something. <laughs> like they had him lined up as a receiver, and he just like sort of ran a route on one of the plays like I know he's out there to make the other team think about what they're going to do but eventually you have to let him throw right that's the whole whole reason he's here is he's a quarterback and like that's the point of having another quarterback on the field it feels like they're going setting it up to uh unleash it sometime uh I'm probably good that they didn't do it against Stanford it wasn't a game they needed to do that in but uh one of these games he's going to throw a pass it's got to happen like they dump it out to him in the uh, you know as if it's a screen or something and he throws it like like Malachi Thomas's touchdown pass last year something like that yeah, you're saying or what they were aiming for in the Miami game when they had Malachi Thomas throw it and then he got intentional grounding to <laughs> that's it's right like, I'm a running back man what do you want me to do we should have a buy or sell every week one of the questions should automatically be will Schley throw a pass this week buy or sell he ran it. questions up there until it actually happens did he run it once against was it Vanderbilt. He ran. He started against Vanderbilt, was in the game, the first play of the game, so that he was listed as a starter for that game. He did uh, have a, a good run towards the end when uh, when Drones was hurt, about a 14-yard yeah, run. Yeah, but they ran Drones something trickeration where he ran it, I thought. I don't remember. Maybe it wasn't the Vanderbilt game, maybe Marshall. Yeah, I, I, I can't remember at all. Yeah, he, he it feels had, like they've not thrown it out of that formation. They have, yeah. he, they have not. No. So, he, Gio, he had two carries in the opener against Vanderbilt, and then he had four against Old Dominion, and, and he hasn't had any since. So, yeah, it, I, I, I agree. And the funny thing is, Gio, you mentioned the reverse. They went back to the reverse against Stanford 
and kept a little bit more simple. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, and it, it continues to work. I mean, this is a play that the Hokies ran last year with like Xavion Turner Bradshaw. I think you've seen Tucker Holloway get into it before. Like I saw Heath against Vanderbilt one carry. That's yeah. True. yeah. So it's like this is a play that it seems like they have a bunch of wrinkles off of, and it works ev- almost every time. Not trying to to kind of pick nits here, as Andy uh, phrased it one time, and I'll I'll never forget that. I'll I'll use that forever. Um, not trying to necessarily uh, get nitpicky here, but thoughts on trying to make something happen at the end of the half. You're already in that comfortable lead, almost almost through an interception. Maybe just run it there. Maybe just run it there. Um, <laughs> you've got to go 80 yards to get a touchdown, or at best 40 yards to even think about a field goal. And Tech doesn't really have the type of passing game to do that. Like, they pass it well when the other team believes that the running game is a threat. So the other team is going to ignore the running game right there because the running game is not going to get you in the field goal range. Right. So uh, I think you've got to understand who you are in that situation. Understand that you're up 14 to nothing and you get the ball first in the second right. half. Right. Uh, so that's the big thing. Situational coaching mistake there. Fortunately, it didn't cost him. Can Except, you, God, can you imagine if, if they had picked that off and returned it for 17 a seconds left, 18 yard line? Yeah. Like, even to get a field goal, you got to go 50 yards. Like, yeah. I know John Love's been booting him from a long distance. 50 yards in 17 seconds is pretty tough to do. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Just. Be content at that <laughs> point. Uh, get into the halftime, like you said, to get in the ball. Don't make a one score or a two score game one score yeah. before you get into that situation. How about how about the efficiency though? Passing the football, uh, Chris. To your point, just over five yards of passing attempt against Miami, yeah. and you're averaging closer to I believe it's above ten you yards. Just about doubled. Yeah, it. yeah. yeah. Um, I, and you have your number of passing attempts almost. Yeah. Um, I, I just it's just there's enough data built up now since. <laughs> Jerome's began his starting career that the like the the lower the number of temps the Hokies have the more efficient they are and that's not a knock on drones that's just the type of offense Virginia Tech runs they ran a similar type of offense under Hendon Hooker and he always had his most efficient games when he threw the ball fewer than 25 times like probably the most efficient was that Louisville game when he threw it's it like, like 10 a, of 10 10, or yeah something. something like that it was crazy um so it's just when you have a strong running game and the opposing team respects your running game then then you you pound them and then you pick your spots with the passing game and the types of passes that you throw basically virginia tech did what to stand to stanford what rutgers did to virginia tech they didn't dominate on the ground but they did just enough to keep the defense honest and that opens up your passing game and if you're, if you're smart about how you use it you can hit big plays in it anything it, else it helps to uh, hit the big one to mm-hmm. felton uh, you know, we've been talking about now oh, what's wrong with Felton all year. I think he had like 78 yards coming into that game. It's like, well, if he hits those two long ones against Rutgers and they count that touchdown against Miami, <laughs> like he's got, then this is his fourth touchdown of the year instead of his first. So, you know, things that are sort of out of his control, uh, I think are, are holding him back a little bit on this because he was open on both those deep balls. Uh, against Rutgers and you know made an incredible effort against Miami and it didn't go his way at the end to, to get the call. So, uh, you know, the, to get him going, I think he had 84 yards in that game. What Sounds was about it? right. Yeah, four so catches for 84 yards. More in this yards. game than he had. More in this game than he had all season. Uh, and, you know, like like last season, it was a little slow in the early going, then he really turned it on the second half of the, the season. So I wonder if this will be something that sort of jump starts him as, as, as the season continues here. Anything else offensively before we dig into some stats with David? Oh, gosh. Uh, just I, th- I thought the offensive line was pretty good considering the level of competition they face because Stanford's run defense is good. And, uh, and again, you know, like Stephen Gosnell is just Mr. Reliable. Yeah. Um, but those are, yeah. I think we covered it pretty well. I think Tootin, to, 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 you know, that tough running on that fourth and one. Ooh, yeah. Uh, they needed a yard, and, you know, David was talking to him afterwards. He's like, yeah, Elijah Brooks comes up to him. It's like, we need a yard. He's like, well, I'll get a touchdown here. <laughs> and that's exactly what he did. And it was one of those really tough runs where he gets hit around the line and just kind of keeps churning the legs and gets into the end zone. I mean, he's a tough runner. Uh, really impressive guy. And, uh, you know, I, I don't write about him all the time in the five thoughts because I don't know what the new thought is. Like, Bashal Tootin is still pretty good. Like, what, <laughs> what is the new thought on him? I feel like we've established what he is uh, each week. So if it feels like he, I'm not addressing that enough in, in my writing like that, it's because it's sort of 
he's the constant with this offense. And, you know, that's a, a great thing to have in a running back. A little concerning now with the prelude, you know, we'll see with his leg. And, you know, he went out of the game there and they had him in a walking boot. I don't know exactly what his status is. And they're, they're getting a little thin at running back at this point, which is a weird thing to talk about a position where they had like 10 scholarship running backs a couple of years ago. <laughs> and now, you know, if Prelo, well, Prelo's not a scholarship guy, but he was in the rotation there. You could be down to like, you know, three, three or four here. I mean, it's getting kind of uh, slim pickings there if he's hurt. With the with the situation coming up, you have the off week, and then you kind of have that not you almost like have like a half off week when you play on a Thursday, and yeah. then you get to wait again to Saturday to play Georgia Tech. Do you think there's a chance Tootin gets back into the return game at all? I'm very hesitant to do that. Um, I I I grew up a Virginia Tech fan, so of course I understand understand the importance of special teams. Sure, but when you, when you consider the likelihood of a kickoff return for a touchdown. And but you, but you really and then you compare that to how important he is to the offense and like literally how does this offense move the football if he's not in there right? I wouldn't play him on kickoff return. No chance. Not worth it. Nope. Not worth it. All right. What you got, David? <clears throat> yeah, on the Tootin point, um, I think I mean he's certainly playing himself into like all ACC contention. I mean he leads the ACC with eight rushing touchdowns. Uh, which is tied for fifth best in the country. He's averaging 106.4 yards per game. The second best in the league behind North Carolina is Omari and Hampton, and 17th in the country. He is, Tootin is pulling his weight and more. Uh, yeah, that was a very funny interaction after the game. Um, Wilson over some, some three uh, stat notes um, from Scott Glessner. Um, he said VT's 55 total offensive plays against Stanford were the fewest in a win since Georgia Tech in 2013. That's uh, a great note. I was texting with somebody during the game, and and he said, we're only going to have six or seven possessions in this game. And I said, no, it's like an old-school Georgia Tech game. You're just not going to have the ball very much. And that, So that's funny that that stat came from a Paul Johnson Team. It was glorious to cover because the game flew oh, by. Yeah. I mean, the first half was 71 minutes, and that was only because they called a couple timeouts there at the end. Uh, dragged out a little bit longer in the second half. But, man, it, it felt like one of those option games where it's just like, all right, keep this clock moving. This yep. is nice. It, it's funny you say that. I was at a game where it was 7 to nothing at halftime, and they're just <laughs> running the football, and I'm like, this game is blazing by. And I'm like, how is Virginia Tech already at halftime? Right. And they both kicked at 3.30. 3.30 local. What you got, David? Um yeah, well, I well, and and off that, I think it's interesting because if you remember the Vanderbilt game at the beginning of the year, one of the things Brent Pry talked about was the Hokies only had four possessions, only really three possessions in that first half, and they did not make the most of it. Chris, you talked about basically Tech wasted that entire first half with just how it approached it. I thought this was. Again, good game planning. Tech and Prime talked about it after the game. Tech understood what Stanford was trying to do. And kind of came out expecting it, controlled the clock, was methodical offensively when it had to be. Um, yeah, Stan I mean, Stanford had the ball for 33 minutes, but it felt like a lot more than that. I think at the end of the first half, it was like a l like 12 minutes to three, something crazy like that. Um, this was the first time Virginia Tech allowed less, allowed fewer than 10 points to an FBS opponent since the 20. Eight to nothing shutout against Pitt in 2019. First time Tech has allowed fewer than 10 points to an FBS opponent. Um, I mean, 10 was basically the benchmark that uh, the the Pride teams um, against Syracuse and somebody else, uh, maybe Boston College, Wake uh, Forest. Yeah, the the, the previous yeah. two seasons. Um, you know, to hold them to seven. Uh, and I asked Caleb Spencer after the game, and he was kind of like, man, it probably should have been zero. Um, and I'm I'm sure we might talk about that play later. Um, v, the third stat, VT has started the season with two-plus sacks every game. That's through six games. The last Virginia Tech team, the last time Virginia Tech started out like this was 2005 when it had two-plus sacks in the first eight games. In 1999, Tech did it every season. I believe that, um, but not maybe not a coincidence that the last time Virginia Tech had a double-digit sack guy was 2005, and they're probably going to have one this year with APR. Yeah, and the, I mean the guys Tech had five sacks, and APR didn't even have didn't have one. This one time. he yeah. had a fumble recovery, and I think I he's got like five or six of them. Two or three of those sacks came in the last 
a few minutes of the game. Yeah. Right. So it was like uh, you've seen the movie Necessary Roughness when the backup quarterback gets in the game and he's hiding behind the ref and like oh, blow yeah. the whistle, blow the whistle. That's kind of like what the end of this game reminded me of. That poor Stanford quarterback just running for his life. I mean, James Jeanette got a sack. Malachi, Malachi Madison, Madison got a sack. Yeah. I mean, it was just meet me at the quarterback. Yeah. Anything else, David? Yeah, uh, the other the other three guys, Caleb Spencer, who I'm sure we'll talk about, Aeneas yep. Peebles, and Josh Fuga were the other three guys with sacks. So, yeah. Um, but Tech is certainly getting in the backfield, and Tech's like, I think it, maybe it was Andy that said it, Tech's like top five in the country in just team sacks. Mm-hmm. So, getting pressure. As always, Tech Sideline is presented by First Bank and Trust Company, where exceptional customer service comes first. First Bank and Trust Company offers a variety of checking and savings account options and are sure to meet all of your banking needs. That includes free checking, so visit firstbank.com to find the account that's right for you. Let's flip the script, talk about this Virginia Tech defense. It felt like, to me, this is... uh, a true bend, but don't break with, with a sprinkle of havoc in there, uh, Brent Pry had alluded to. Wanted to go back to our point talking about some of these havoc plays. That's four turnovers for Virginia Tech that have been forced inside their own six-yard line the last three weeks. You had the Rutgers fumble at the three, Mose Phillips with the pick, Caleb Spencer with the pick, both of those against Miami, and then, of course, uh, Lampson's fumble at the three-yard line for Stanford this past weekend. Andy also had written about that does that doesn't even include the uh, fourth down stop they had against Rutgers at the one yard line. If it happens once or twice, you can say, okay, the nice fluky plays. They're making a play at the goal line. Well, now it's continuing to happen, and this is a little bit of a trend here. What has gone into that? Because again, they're bending, but but they're not breaking. They're making the plays when they need to. Well, I think as far as the two fumbles go, there's, the hits were just good, solid hits. You know, uh, you still have to rely on the other team fumbling, but but you can you know you help yourself out by by tackling well, by putting your shoulder pads and your helmet where they're supposed to be. And I think Virginia Tech has has done a, a better job of that. Uh, the disguise the coverage once against Miami, um, maybe twice. Um, so I think you know multiple things go into it. Whenever there's a turnover, it's always yeah, good job by causing it, but also like somebody had to throw the pass. Right? Sure, somebody had to fumble. Um, it's good to see um, because a lot of teams you'll see you know they give up long drives and they'll just fold and say oh we'll start again next next drive and do better next time. It's good to see them stay in the fight. Till, till the very end. But at the same time, you can't depend on this continuing to happen, right? Well, so I would say, for me, let's go ahead and try to force a few more three and outs, but it is good to see them finishing drives. Yeah, I, I think it uh, you know, speaks to just sort of the, the effort that the defense puts in. I mean, sometimes opposing teams get inside the red zone and it's, it's like the the other defense almost concedes it. And they're like, well, this is going to be points here no matter what at this point. You know, Virginia Tech is tied for 10th nationally, 69.23 scoring percentage for opponents in the red zone, which means, you know, 30 plus percent of the time, they're not coming away with points down there. That's pretty good. If you can keep them I in, mean, when you get down there in the red zone, you're, you're expected to give up at least three, but sometimes they're not giving up any because they're, they're making these plays and, uh, you know, we talked to Aeneas Peebles afterwards. It's just like it's sort of a mentality. It's like don't concede anything. And that that's the way they've been. And it's, it's uh, yeah, like you said, I don't know how sustainable it is because teams are getting down there and eventually they're going to break through in those opportunities. But to, to do what they've done so far and keep teams out, it's been pretty impressive. You guys have been really impressed by Caleb Spencer. Why is that? Because he keeps making plays. <laughs> He's all over the field. I mean, uh, I mean, if he could get the sack on the initial blitz. <laughs> He, I mean, he'd be up there in the team leaders right now. I mean, he, he obviously had the one that uh, you know Cam Ward you know ran through his tackle and then flipped it out. And that was a huge play there. He came by and flew by the quarterback this time against Stanford and knocked the ball loose. And then the Stanford quarterback picked it up. And then he came back and sacked him for a loss after that. But I mean, he's all over the field right now. The the interception last week, a couple plays in the backfield. I think he had three tackles for loss in this game. Uh, I mean, I know they have a starter in Keontae Jenkins there, and Jenkins had a big pick later in the game too at star linebacker. Uh, but it feels like Spencer needs needs to get more snaps because just when he's out there, he's making plays. And you know, Brent Price said afterwards he need, needs to learn a little bit more playing within the framework of the defense. I think that's something that you'd expect for somebody who arrived in May. I mean, he was a late arrival or committed in May and didn't get here until the summer. He was a late transfer coming in here, didn't have the benefit of spring ball. But uh, man, when somebody's making plays like that, you find ways to get them on the field. 
And remember, he was the only player to actually stop that one passing play that Rutgers ran over and over. <laughs> was and over. he the one? He on was that the one, one that okay. stopped it down on the goal line, right? Um, and actually, he was at the will position that game or, or that particular play instead of star it was almost they were like okay just put somebody else at will and maybe they'll happen to stop it and he stopped it um i think what stands out to me is you know his age he's only a true sophomore not only is he only a true sophomore but this is his first year his first semester like andy said in this scheme so he went to miami last year learned one scheme then came at virginia tech has learned another scheme in just a few months and he's playing at a pretty high level already. Like, imagine if he had had a spring practice, or imagine if he had been in the program last year and and redshirted and learned well, the and system. He, and, he was playing safety at Miami. Right, right, correct. Like he's changing, he's right. changed positions right, right. and is playing well. He, right, he's doing things that normally pl- most players can't do, like switch positions and then be effective at their new position in a very quick amount of time. Like that's not common. You can't expect that to happen with the majority of your players, but it's happened with him and shows that he's just got a high aptitude for the game and and probably just basic football instincts that not everybody has. Another interesting quote that came out of uh, Aeneas (laughs) Peebles after the game, he said, we are not confused on what good football looks like for the Hokies. I, I found that to be interesting. Good quote. Yeah, That's a good quote. Like I, I was reminded good. afterwards. I'm like, oh man, I got to get that at the top of my five thoughts because it just sort of summed up the whole thing. So Aeneas Peebles coming through in more ways than one on the field and then in the post game with these quotes. Some good quotes coming out of this game. That one, and I swear when I when I read your quote with drones saying I was trying to be somebody that I'm not, I was like, I'm pretty sure we've said those exact words on the podcast like several times this year. You know, um, so lots of good quotes coming out of this game. Everybody wants to talk after a win like that. Yeah, <laughs> for sure. Like, oh yeah, absolutely. I'll, well, I'll do it. Yeah. 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 That's the benefit. Like people are like, oh, you don't root for the team to win. It's like, well, I root for my story, and it's always a little bit better when guys want to talk like that after the game. Although the Miami story turned out all right, and I don't think anybody felt like talking after that one. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that was that was a uh, that was kind of uh, there's an exception to every rule. That that was the exception there. Uh, if you're gonna have a loss, have a crazy story like that. Oh, well, the count to Jenkins interception, just to kind of piggyback off of how we've been talking about these havoc plays, talking about these these turnovers. We've always on this set called turnovers kind of fluky. This year it feels a little bit different, though. The Hokies um, have forced nine turnovers this season, ranking them 26th in the country. Uh, last year they had 16 all year. That was good for 86. So you're seeing some serious improvement there. You're seeing some serious improvement. Um, you know, you've you got to make sure they don't get down there, though. Like, So they are fortunate a little bit. Like On that fourth down run by Stanford, like he almost got through that last tackle without tripping up and you know, it would have been, it would have been a touchdown, and then boom, lo and behold. I believe you're talking about the Quentin Reddish tackle. Yes, I think so. Which, yeah, touchdown-saving tackle touchdown from saving, a true like, freshman. Right, he almost got in that end zone, and then they fumbled like a play or two later. And then, you know, the interception by Miami down on the goal line. Well, they threw a touchdown pass the play before that and got called for a hold that, quite frankly, was pretty questionable, right? So these some of these turnovers are a little bit for fortunate that they happen. I give credit for them happening, but, again, you can't – you can't depend on that happening each and every week. You've got to you got to play it a little more straight up from here on out. I think. Are you saying that the quarterback is not going to just set it on a tee like that to Keontae Jenkins at the end? That, I mean, that was yeah. That was that was uh, not great. I believe that is uh, how Dorian Strong described a nice little lollipop. There is yeah. That's how he described one that Monsoor had against ODU early in the season. I mean, he just. It was just straight to him. And it's like, you know, he's a defender, so you don't always expect him to catch that. But, I, yeah, that was a fairly easy interception. I just realized we've gone the whole podcast without mentioning the quarterback's name. What, what was his name? Lamps- Justin Lampson. Lampson. Yeah. Um, he was a career 44. You've got to earn three. that respect. You've got to earn that. Game. Come on. You've, um, he, was a, he went into the game career 44, 44.3% passer. And now I understand why. After watching him play a game, I mean, that, like he honestly, like I don't mean any disrespect or anything. He, he did a decent job running, but like he, he probably should be playing at the FCS level. He just does not have talent passing the ball. Yeah, that is a one-time Syracuse Orangeman right there. Yeah, <laughs> back in the day. All right, let's let's kind of step back because well, you you didn't we didn't even talk about uh, the job that the quarterbacks did on Ao Manor. I mean, they, they did a great job on him. Sure did. Uh, didn't get to four catches. That's right. I believe Nick was the only one who got that Dang, in true. the uh, buy or sell. Although 
that last drive, he was open so many times. That's where you get that is in the garbage time, and the quarterback wasn't even looking in his direction. So I digress there. But, I mean, pretty good job by – I mean, the, the the touchdown that he caught, they had to do it on a trick play. Yeah. And he barely caught it. Did yeah. he catch it? It was, yeah. it was right inside there. His toe might have been on the well, line. Well, the ruling close. stood. They said right. the ruling stands, so they didn't confirm it. They said they didn't have video evidence to overturn oh, yeah, it. Oh, really? Is that what happens when you don't have video how, evidence that's to how overturn re- something? <laughs> that's how replay is supposed to work on that. But, I mean, three catches. <laughs> Catches for I think thirty three yards and, and yeah. the touchdown. I think you take that any day. So I, I think a good job by the corners in that game. And the quarterback struggled, but you don't, you still don't get those kind of numbers against a, a receiver like that unless you play pretty good defense. And how about the deep post? It was early in the game, and I think it was Delane. Delane that knocked it. Out. This was one of the yeah. few good throws on the day. I mean, it was down there, and then Delane got his hand over the top without was interfering nice. and poked it out. That was a great play. So kind of stepping back a little bit because week to week, it's so easy to be on a roller coaster of highs and lows yeah. and whatnot. We're almost midway point of the season. We are midway point of the season. Uh, you've played six games, three and three on the year, one and one in ACC play. Does this team look like one? The last two weeks, what you've seen against Miami and Stanford, that's maybe poised to go on a little bit of a run like they did last year. I think they have that capability. They've, they've The last two weeks, they've looked like the team I expected them to look like before the season, and I think they'd have a much better record now. Have they figured some things out earlier with like how to use drones and, and, and things like that? Um, and maybe with a little better in-game management and things like that. So I'm I'm both optimistic and pessimistic at the same time. I'm optimistic from the fact that um, things are trending up, and all these games are winnable. Absolutely, they're Very all true. winnable. Tech seems like they're peaking. They figure things out. Even Clemson looks winnable. Sure, because Clemson struggled to stop the run, and Virginia Tech has uh, has run it very well. On the other hand, and I, and I forget which ranking system this is, whether it's ESPN or FEI or whatever, Virginia Tech has just one win over a top 70 team under Brent Pry, and that was Boston College last year, who was ranked exactly 70th. Mm. Look at the rest of the schedule. Every team left on the schedule is in the top 70. So this is a schedule full of teams that Virginia Tech has pretty much no history of beating so far under Pry. So they're starting to play better, but they're also going to have to start doing some things that they haven't been doing. And uh, I'll go back again. The last seven games, they faced a backup quarterback in three of those games. They're three and zero against backup quarterbacks, one and three against starting quarterbacks. With the one win over the Marshall quarterback, the three quarterbacks they face with a pulse have lit them up. Even the Rutgers quarterback, who has been awful the last two weeks, right? Um, so they're not going to be facing a bunch of bad quarterbacks or backup quarterbacks down the stretch. So I, I agree that te- the defensively tech has gotten better. I just don't know how much at this point. So uh, we're about to find out, though. Yeah, I, I think the important thing to remember is that every team left on the schedule is better than Stanford. And certainly better than Stanford with a backup quarterback. Yeah. So th- this is going to be the the easiest win that they're going to have the rest of the year. And you, know, you look at it, you know, B.C., didn't look so hot at Virginia. They and outplayed him most of the game. It was yeah, turnovers. Uh, yeah. yeah it's, uh, how healthy is Castellanos? Uh, he'll get back, obviously, with the, the extra time here, I would imagine. But, you know, UVA a little bit better than anybody thought in the mm-hmm. beginning of the year. Duke, uh, I know they tripped up this week, but they were uh, 4-0, 5-0, something like that Good before defense. that. Yeah. Uh, so, the, the, you know, there's a challenge in the second half of the season. It's not going to be like last year where there were some, you know, sort of easy wins out there that they, they rolled over those teams. So it's going to be a test, and it'll be interesting to see how this team responds. It's kind of interesting, the the bullets, so to speak, that have been dodged. I think coming into the year, we were like, yes, we don't have to play Louisville, don't have to play Florida State. Well, Louisville's still pretty decent, but uh, I think you'd love to play Florida State now, and now you can sit here and say, well, at least we don't got to play a top 25 pit and SMU team. What a shame it's not Florida State coming to Blacksburg on Thursday night instead of Boston College, right? <laughs> Well, you, we're looking That's at like a gimme win. You're like, hey, you don't get Florida State, you don't get NC State, another, you know, and right. they stink too. They're they're bad. They've been yeah. bad too. So, I mean. We think we know what's going to happen going into the season, and then it's just, you know, that's college football. And that's the transfer transfer portal impact as well. Absolutely. Everybody said Florida State reloaded, and and Grayson McCall was going to be it at NC State. uh, Uh, No, I I didn't say that. Oh, fair, fair. You did not say that. I didn't say that. Lots of the national media Uh had said that um, with NC State as a possible contender uh, in this ACC conference. Well, you, you take a look at the off week coming up. What, What has to be the emphasis for this team this week? Is it... Let's, let's rest up as much as possible, get some of the other guys' reps, or, or do you stay very, very locked in? You get extra prep time for BC. 
I mean, I expect they'll take a couple of days off. I don't know how he'll exactly he'll handle it, but uh, you tr- you can get healthy. Um, hopefully, Ollie Jennings can yeah. play more effectively. I think he got 22 snaps this past week. Um, I don't think he had anything thrown his, in his direction. Uh, you know, obviously, if you're only playing 22 snaps in a game where you're not throwing it that much, you're not going to have that much of a chance for action. But he's a guy that if he can get 100% and get out there and, and, you know, be playing 40 snaps or 45 snaps, something like that, then you can add a little bit more explosiveness to the offense, I think. Uh, and, and, again, tootin has got a chance to get back to 100%. I'm looking for him to have 20 plus carries over the next two games because of the extra time he's got between those games. But from a mental standpoint, I, I'm glad that Virginia Tech played immediately after the Miami game rather than having their bye week oh, and then dwelling on it. Um, but now, you know, I think they, after playing well for the last two weeks, I think maybe they've gained a little bit of confidence. Now you can get healthy and really dial it in for the final six games. Yeah, Jennings. Tootin, uh, Stephen Gosnell, mm-hmm. I think, has been a little bit limited. Kelly Lawson has not played a whole lot. He didn't play at uh, all against uh, Stanford. I mean, he was out there, but yeah, I don't. Think, I'm not sure about defensive snaps. I didn't look at that total. No, he had none. No uh, defensive snaps. You wonder about you know somebody how how long until Jalen Stroman can get back? Mm-hmm. And now he's got an extra you know week and a half here. We haven't asked about him lately. Haven't seen him at practice, so that's not a good sign that it's imminent or anything like that. But if he's going to get back at some point this season, that's going to be start to to trend that way here pretty soon in terms of, of getting prepared for that. So, uh, you know, you're at the midway point of the year, which is hard to believe that they're halfway done with the season, but uh, this is where there's a lot of bumps and bruises out there. And uh, I would imagine the veterans get a little bit more time off this week. They, they let some of the younger guys uh, get the reps and, and like you said, extra prep for the next game. You guys, uh, Chris had said that he wanted them to come into Stanford and, and play a certain way. Uh, and I'll let you be the one to say it, but do you think that they did that yeah. uh, this weekend? Yeah. I thought they played a certain way and I thought they coached a certain way. And, uh, your players are going to play better when they're coached right. And I thought that was a terrific game plan and, and the right philosophy going into this game. And, you know, the players came through with it too, of course. But uh, I thought the the, the, the direction, uh, the leadership going into this game was very, very good. And, and they answered the bell. And now the rest of the season is just about doing something that they haven't done much of before. And if they can do that, then they've taken a step forward. Well, for whatever it's worth, Virginia Tech is ranked, and it's really not worth all that much, but Virginia Tech is ranked 28th in ESPN's FPI Football Power Index. Miami is 10th, Rutgers is 44th, and Vanderbilt is 41st. Those are three of uh, Virginia Tech's losses, and now the Hokies sit above them. Vanderbilt loss doesn't look so crazy. No. Now. Oh, okay, let's play the transitive property game. Again. <laughs> okay, so... Uh, Georgia Southern, get to Georgia so, so State, the, 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 Georgia the, the, State Georgia, right? the Georgia Bulldogs are probably the third best team in the state of Georgia. <laughs> All right, so so Georgia Southern hammered Georgia State, hammered them, and then Georgia State beat Vanderbilt, who beat Alabama, who beat Georgia. You know, so probably Georgia Southern, the best team in in, in Georgia. Where does Georgia Tech factor into all that? Because they beat Georgia know. State. They did. Yeah. It's like a little circular. So maybe George is only the fourth thing. best team in their own in their home state. It, it'll be interesting this week to see how that Alabama loss gets spun. Yeah, it's like, well, that just shows you the depth of the SEC. Like, I feel like you get a lot of those takes. It's like, well, nobody was saying that when Virginia Tech lost it, <laughs> right? And everybody, it, it, like, you know, we saw it. We're like, this Pavi guy's a dude. Yeah, he is. Like he's he, and Jerry Kill can coach too. That's my other takeaway on that. They <laughs> they brought in some pretty good coaches to revamp that offense from New Mexico State. So. Uh, it'll be interesting to see how that's framed this week. And, you know, oh, Alabama's had an off week, or, oh, this shows the depth of the SEC. It's like people weren't saying that when Virginia Tech lost. It was the end of the world, and, and now it doesn't look like it's quite like that. It's still not great because, you know, that was a game they should have won, I thought. And they came back to took the lead, and if they didn't throw away the entire first half, I think they'd probably win that uh, fairly comfortably. But... It's maybe not the, uh, you, you know, don't put it in the, like, JMU Bad 2010 loss, yeah. category or, or, you know, ODU 2018, something like that. I have a novel idea. Why not one of these Power 5 teams that keep hiring Jerry Kill as an advisor? Why doesn't somebody just hire him as a head coach? I wonder if he wants to be a head coach. I mean, he was in maybe New Mexico not at that State. Level. And, yeah. like, you know, maybe, you know, he's had the health issues in the past. Yeah. I wonder if it's just less stressful to just be in charge of the offense or doing the stuff that he's doing right now. Yeah. Let, let somebody else be the lightning rod right. at the top of the program like <laughs> yeah. that. Like he's clearly good at it and he could do that. 
Uh, but interestingly, since leaving Minnesota, he hasn't been a head coach at like a, a power program. Like he had just, to go to New, Me- go to New, New Mexico. Mexico State. He's wearing like ponchos and getting tattoos after they go to a bowl game uh, <laughs> one time. That guy is a character. I'll, I'll say that much. But he knows how to coach football. And then clearly it's helping Vanderbilt quite a bit this year. I've told my Jerry Kill story on the podcast before, haven't I? About how he was our top Which source. One? Which years. one? About how he was TSL's top source in 2019 and he didn't even know it. No, I, I don't know if I remember. Oh, this okay. One. So, uh, yeah, Kill would like to uh, go to a certain bar uh, uh, around the Blacksonburg, Christiansburg area. And uh, I think that's how I, another Jerry Kill story. Yeah, yeah. It, and, it uh, may or may not be so, true. Uh, where's where he originally from? Uh, Kansas or something or like something that. Like that. So, but anyway, when, okay. he, was, he, was, he, was when like, he was here as, as an advisor, his, sure. his, the watering hole that he preferred happened to be the same watering hole as a TSL subscriber preferred. So remember, I was on vacation one summer, and this guy started DMing me on Twitter, and uh, was basically like, "Yep, Jerry Kill comes in the bar all the time, and he's telling me this and this and this and this and this." And I'm like, "Okay, that's interesting." And then the stuff starts happening, right? So I could tell it was legit, and uh, apparently, uh, so I, I'd, I'd report, I, I'd report, I would write a bunch of articles and say, "Here's what I've heard, and then what's going to happen," and it would all happen, right? <laughs> so. Somebody told me last year, a former staff member who I knew, I told him that story and he was like, whoa, we tried to figure out who the leak was in 2019 because we didn't know how TSL was getting all this information, but we could never figure out who the leak was. And it was Jerry Kill and Jerry Kill didn't even know it, but. Well, I don't think he cares. I don't think he cares. I, I think he does not care but, whose yeah. toes he steps on, who he insults along the way. He's nope. going to tell it like it is. Yep. And, you know, he's a. Uh, you know, grizzled old football coach, and he doesn't have time for you know posers out there. So he, he just goes straight at it. It's very effective, obviously. He's the modern Phil L. Mashin. That's right. Yeah. yeah, we we had to we had to take a different route at some point. I knew yeah. it was inevitable uh, in the podcast. We always do. We always also. This is unrelated to anything, but I've got, I've got a couple travel rants. Please, uh, from our Please. trip. I saw here. your tweets. They were the cracking waffle me up. maker thing. Oh God. Oh my gosh. It, if there's a line for the waffle maker at the hotel lobby, just make one and move on. This people making two waffles. I mean, it takes three minutes per waffle. It's absurd. I, I'm like turning into Larry David over this stuff now. Like cranky old man complaining <laughs> about this. One lady in front of me made three waffles in a row. Three waffles. She was going to bring them to her kids, but like the waffles were bigger than her kids, so she didn't need three of them to feed these children. It's 10 minutes worth of waffle making right there. Uh, it's absurd. Like a little more like just be conscious of other people around you and that. This this extends to our flight, too. We took a red eye home <laughs> last night. And, you know, it's kind of understood a red eye. Everybody's going to try to sleep. So maybe be quiet or, you know, <laughs> keep, keep the lights off. And the, the entire plane is like pitch black, except for this one guy, two rows in front of us, who has his light on the entire flight watching a video on his phone it's like you don't need the light on for that so like people are trying to sleep here and then two rows behind us two ladies are talking like they're in a you know a lunch spot in the middle of the day like loud conversations like i could hear they're talking about like their itinerary changing i'm like this doesn't this conversation doesn't need to be going on right now it's like it's impossible to sleep with these two people yakking behind us this light in front of us it's absurd. People need to be aware of their surroundings a little bit better when it comes to waffles, when it comes to red eyes. It's absurd. And that, that's the end of my rant. And yes, I'm turning into Larry David, an old grumpy man here, but it's ridiculous and it needs to end. Have you Didn't, seen Curb Your Enthusiasm? Oh, I've I seen assume. all of them. Oh, yes, of course. Didn't Bill Roth have a bad travel story too? Oh, Something, yeah. yeah. Yeah, Bill was Bill was talking to me about it. There was some guy that like was trying to basically get in a verb did get in a verbal argument with him or tried to like fight him kind of on the plane and <laughs> and everybody around Bill like backed him. Right. Yeah, and I think the guy tried to pull some line about oh I make this much money and blah 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 and didn't Bill say something like imagine how much you'd make if you had people skills? <laughs> <laughs> did, did I, am, I, am I dreaming that? I think I saw that, didn't I? I uh, clearly missed I a lot going to Columbus. I want to believe that it's true. If that's the case. <laughs> yes, yeah, that's okay. what I was told. <laughs> There we go. There we go. Oh, good times. Sorry if I shouldn't have told that story. No. We're, we're, we're sharing fun stories. Today. You know, if, if Bill listened this long, you should be flattered that he listened uh, to this one to the podcast. Uh, my, well, see anyway. how much more fun podcasts are when you win a game? 
by 24 points. Yeah, wonderful. Yeah. Yeah. Speaking of winning, it's <laughs> worth just, just mentioning the unbelievable comeback for Virginia Tech women's soccer yesterday. Ooh. Playing the defending national champions at Thompson Field. They were down 2 to nothing with 11 minutes left in the game. They scored three goals in the final 11 minutes to win the ball game against Florida State 3-2. to two. I mean, Stuff like that just does not happen, particularly in that oh, sport. Oh, it, it happened to Tottenham yesterday. It's up two nothing, lost three two. <laughs> okay, so I guess yeah, it does yeah, it happen. Does. I, I, and I hated it. It was awful. They just stood there and didn't defend anybody. <laughs> and I didn't. I'll give Virginia Tech a lot more credit than I'm going to Brighton, of course. But yes, that's a great comeback against the defending national champs who are uh, ranked uh, sixth in the country. Um, so that's both the soccer programs have, have really turned their fortunes around this year um, and look like. Uh, you know, definite postseason contenders. Prior to this week, the Seminoles had not lost a game since December 2nd, 2022 against North Carolina in the College Cup. So wow. that, that's that's something right there. Uh, and Virginia Tech beat them after they had lost to Wake Forest 4-1 to on Thursday last week. So unfortunately, Tech wasn't the first to, to break the ice, so mm. to speak. Wake Forest did that, but uh, Virginia Tech with the big comeback definitely was, was really cool to see. Their next ball game, they'll host SMU on Thursday at 7 p.m. Uh, so coming out to, to Thompson and check out some soccer because both the men's and women's teams are kind of rolling right so now. So I wonder how many games SMU will be playing on their East Coast tour. Because surely not going to come in just to play one game against Virginia Tech, right? They're going to play like you'd two think, or three you'd games. you think UVA and Duke and yeah, something, something like yeah. that. Yeah, no doubt about it. All right, guys. Well, it has been fun. Um, what, what are our game plans? Let's decide the game plans right now. No pod later this week, Nick. Is that the case with there not being a game? No pod later this week. So... Uh, uh, He's pointing at he's, David. He's pointing at David. David. What? Where are you going? David, where are you going? Yeah, we got best, ACC basketball media days in Charlotte. I'm taking Carter Hill with me. So he's, nice. Carter will have a bunch of audio video content. Last year he had uh, he had some great interviews with Kelly Gramlich. He talked to Seth Greenberg. That interview did very well. Um, so Carter and I will be down in Charlotte, ACC basketball media days. It's two weeks earlier this year, which I don't really like um, because it's like, then you've got, you know, Tech, Tech already did its media day, so it's earlier. Uh, and maybe this is my gripe for the day. Um, and then the ACC moves it up two weeks, and so now it's like, we'll finish ACC media days and still have, like, three weeks until the season starts. Whereas usually it was like, okay, like, a week after or two weeks after the season starts. But anyway, I will be in Charlotte uh, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday uh, this week. So lots of basketball stuff. Um, and it's not right around the corner, but it's, it's coming up. And then we're going to have an interesting layout, of course, next week, because, uh, we got to preview a Thursday game instead of, uh, instead of a Saturday game. So we're definitely going to be hollering at you before you know it. Uh, but we got the off week this week and for Nick Brown, for David Cunningham, for Andy Bitter, for Chris Coleman, I'm Giovanni Heater saying so long. It's another Hokies win.